Developing right now on Morning News Now, a battle for the ballot. This morning, a high-stakes case going before the Supreme Court. This former President Donald Trump fights to keep his name on the primary ballot in Colorado. We're going to break down the claim that he's ineligible for office and what it all means for the Republican frontrunner in the race for the White House. Also this morning, gridlock from Capitol Hill to the southern border as Republicans try once again to come together on a separate foreign aid bill. What would you say to Americans concerned that Congress isn't able to do basic functions? Well, it's just simply not true. We're, we're, we're governing here. Sometimes it's messy. Plus, an NBC News exclusive, President Biden considering executive action to try and end the border crisis. We have team coverage. Also, new developments out of the Middle East. American retaliation efforts still underway for an attack that killed three U.S. soldiers. Now, U.S. forces claim to have killed a leader of an Iran-backed militia. We are going to bring you the latest. And a big price for the big game. That's right, this year's Super Bowl shaping up to be one of the most expensive ever. We're going to take you to Las Vegas, where football fans are doing some super splurging. Or you can just watch at home, where it's basically free, except for what you pay for nachos. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Thursday. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. We're going to begin in Washington, where former President Trump's efforts to remain on the 2024 ballot could now be in the hands of the Supreme Court. The justices are set to hear arguments today in Mr. Trump's appeal of a Colorado Supreme Court ruling that said he was ineligible to run for the White House. This stems from the former president's alleged meddling in the 2020 election and the events that led to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. The Colorado court pointed to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which bars people who engaged in insurrection from holding any public office. The Trump legal team argues that amendment cannot be used to keep him off the ballot. For more on this case that could have huge implications for the 2024 election, we're joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos and NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Good morning to both of you, Ken. Let's begin with you. Give us a lay of the land on what's going to take place at the Supreme Court today and who are the justices expected to hear from? Good morning, Joe. Yeah, this is arguably the most politically fraught and significant case the Supreme Court has heard since it decided the 2000 election in Bush v. Gore. Uh, background here, there was a five-day trial in Colorado in November after which a judge ruled that former President Donald Trump did engage in insurrection. And that's important because there's a fact record here. That judge ruled that Trump could remain on the ballot, but the Colorado Supreme Court ultimately decided that he could not. And Mr. Trump's lawyers say in a brief that that's one of 30 states where efforts are underway to try to keep him off the ballot. In some cases, judges, though, have already ruled that he should remain on the ballot. So we have a classic split in the circuits, the classic example of where the Supreme Court normally has to weigh in and tell us what the law is here. And so the justices today are going to hear from lawyers for some individual plaintiffs, including a 91-year-old uh, Colorado Republican former member of the legislature who is leading this effort to keep Mr. Trump off the ballot. They'll also hear for attorneys for the Colorado Secretary of State, and they'll hear from Mr. Trump's attorneys. And uh, again, the stakes could not be higher here. The constitutional issues are momentous. This is a Civil War era provision that was aimed mainly at Confederates, but has been used against other people subsequently, though rarely. Uh, and obviously, the implications either way are huge. Joe. Yeah, Danny, let's bring you in here. So Colorado Secretary of State says states can, quote, rightfully disqualify oath breaking insurrectionists under that Section three of the 14th Amendment, something many of us probably didn't pay much attention to in school. And now we're learning a lot about uh, explain to us what the challenges are with interpreting this particular clause. The Colorado court, the Supreme Court, concluded that Donald Trump, number one, engaged in insurrection, a finding that was made by the district court, the lower court. And it also concluded, contrary uh, to the court before it, that, yes, Donald Trump was an officer within the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So he's covered by that part of the Constitution. But there are many more issues beyond that that the Supreme Court will be looking at. For example, one of Justice Kavanaugh's favorite refrains is, who decides? And that is a really critical question here. Who decides that Donald Trump is an insurrectionist? Is it the Colorado state court or is it the Colorado secretary of state? Is it something else? Is it Congress that makes that decision? Who decides is a very relevant question uh, in this case. And related to that is, do the courts themselves, if they don't decide, did they have any power to hear this in the first place. So the two primary issues before the Colorado courts were, was there an insurrection that the, this person engaged in? 
And is he an officer within the meaning of Section 3? Those are the primary issues, but again, there are many others attendant to it. Ken, I want to look at a recent poll. We've got a YouGov UMass Amherst poll that shows when it comes to the issue of removing the former president from the ballot, Americans are fairly evenly split on where they stand. Democrats obviously much more likely to support removal. Most Republicans are against it. But no matter how you feel, you want a quick answer here because so much is at stake. So how soon could we expect a ruling from the Supreme Court here? That's the multi-million dollar question, Joe. Most people think that the Supreme Court will feel compelled to act quickly here before the March 5th Super Tuesday primary, for example. But there's so many different options here. The Supreme Court has off-ramps where they don't even decide this case, or they can sort of punt on the main issue and decide, for example, that there's no self-executing statute for this 14th Amendment provision, so therefore it doesn't apply. So this could go in a lot of different directions, but you're absolutely right. What most Americans want is a quick decision. And Danny, at least for now, Trump is still on the ballot in Colorado for Super Tuesday. Real quickly, though, here, if the court rules against him, the Supreme Court, what are the implications of that? It really depends on how the Supreme Court rules against him. As Ken said, there are a lot of different off-ramps. By the way, Ken raised yet another issue that comes up, which is, does the amendment itself have the power? Does it, is it self-executing? Or did Congress have to enact a separate statute? A good example is prohibition. Prohibition was a constitutional amendment, but prohibition didn't prohibit anything until Congress had to enact a separate statute, the Volstead Act. So that's just yet another, Ken brilliantly brought up, yet another issue that they are going to be looking at in the Supreme Supreme Court. There are just so many here. Ken and Danny bringing up lots of brilliant points this morning to set us up ahead of this big hearing today. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Now to the breakdown in Congress over the border security bill. After Senate Republicans blocked the bipartisan immigration deal that was negotiated by one of their own, they're expected to meet this morning the goal garnering enough votes to pass a supplemental aid bill. And on Wednesday, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer forced a vote on the package, which includes funding to Israel and Ukraine and none for the southern border. Schumer argues the bill's passage is critical. More, we're joined by NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, let's start with those funding bills for Ukraine and Israel. As we just mentioned, Republicans are supposed to meet this morning to try and figure out a plan forward. Where do things stand? They're completely all over the place, Joe. In fact, I was outside of a two-hour private closed-door lunch meeting between Senate Republicans for context. They never last that long. And it was described as heated by multiple sources because they couldn't agree on a path forward. Even the Republican whip, the vote counter in the Senate, John Thune, uh, who never curses, never steps out of line, uh, got a little bit frustrated in the meeting, calling out Republicans using expletives. I won't repeat here for the fact that, listen, guys, we're going to have to vote for this no matter what. Ukraine needs the funding. Israel needs the funding. The border package was already nixed. We got to just get on the floor and do it. So last night, Majority Leader Schumer closed out the floor and said he's going to give time for Republicans to figure their things out so they can return this afternoon and potentially take this up and see if they can get to those 60 votes to pass it. So that meeting this morning is going to be very key. Here's one reason why things are getting a little complicated. We had a year of turmoil for House Republicans in 2023. Now Speaker Johnson already being threatened. He could be ousted by at least one notable congresswoman if he cuts any deal on Ukraine funding. How real is this threat to his speakership? This was always the threat, right? And this is something that happened under ousted Speaker Kevin McCarthy, where only one member can call up that vote to vacate the speaker. You're talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Of course, she despises sending more aid to Ukraine. So she's used this threat continuously, but I don't think it's as real for Johnson yet as it was for McCarthy. And that's because Johnson is still trying to figure his members out and play his cards right. For example, I had sources who told me that if that Ukraine and Israel package does come over from the Senate, Johnson let McConnell and Rick Scott know, who was, of course, a McConnell foe who doesn't support aid to Ukraine, uh, that he is likely going to break this up into individual bills, which will give him some cover with his members. Only question is, uh, will that pass in the Senate? That's an open question. And then when it comes over to the House, what happens with Democrats who want to support that package, too? And where does that package all go? Does it get attached to the funding bills in March? Uh, it's really all a hot mess right now, Joe. I, I've never seen anything like it. And certainly McConnell is having a hard time in the Senate as well, controlling his members. We uh, need a flow chart, I think, to try and figure out all the different possibilities here. Let's talk <laughs> about that now vanquished bipartisan border bill. Republican support for the bill evaporated almost as soon as the deal was announced. So what are we hearing from Republicans this morning? about the border. 
Well, that's a really good question because, of course, Republicans originally wanted that issue tied with any aid to Ukraine. Now they're saying they should be considered separately. It really feels like the goalpost is moving every single day, and Republicans aren't on the same page about how to move forward here, which is making this challenging. I did have a chance to talk to Senator Langford yesterday, who was the Republican negotiator on this bipartisan border bill, and I asked him point blank, if this Ukraine and Israel package moves through, clearly the border is dead, is there any chance of getting border security done this year? Here's what he said. Putting this clean bill without the border security provisions on the floor later today, there's a chance it could pass. Does that mean Republicans' chances to secure the border this year are over? It would be. Uh, at that point, I, I can't imagine anyone would take it up. Obviously, I've gone through this the last four months negotiating all the process. Everybody's kind of seen the media assaults that have happened on me in the past several weeks on it. And you were censured. Yeah, well. I, yeah. and so I, I, would, I would expect any other Republicans going to say, hey, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go through that, especially in this year. Of course, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, has made this an election issue. Republicans want to keep it as one. The question is, will Democrats be able to capitalize on this? We'll see. All right, Julie Sirkin, lots to cover this morning. Thank you so much. Now, with that bipartisan border bill officially done, NBC News has learned the Biden administration is considering taking executive action to try and deter illegal migration across the southern border. That's according to two U.S. officials. For more, we're joined by NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Julia, the Biden administration has already taken a number of unilateral actions to try and stem the flow of migrants. What kind of measures is the White House now considering here? Well, first thing we have to say is anything they're considering will pale in comparison to what this border bill would have accomplished because they won't have the funding to carry it out. Right now, we're still waiting for details. This is something in the early phases, but they're exploring their options. One thing they could do is expand on a program they already have for families where the house, uh, head of the household is on an ankle monitor. They have to re check in regularly, and they're put on a path for expedited removal. That means if they don't qualify to be here, they can be deported more quickly. Uh, that's something they're already doing in a number of cities. They could expand that. They could expand that beyond that certain that group of families. Uh, that's one thing that they could be looking at right now. We're not getting into the details because they're all still being fleshed out. But in short, even if you do have a program that would deter migration when people are coming across the southern border, if you raise the bar on asylum, if you try to deport more people living in the interior, all of that requires manpower. It requires people to process. The immigrants decide whether or not they can stay. It requires agents to actually go out and do the arresting. It requires planes to fly people back. And they're running short on cash and manpower, Joe. So, Julia, I mean, the president has not been shy about his frustrations with congressional Republicans. What's the White House saying now about this new plan? Some officials are calling Plan B, which is basically Ukraine funding without border security. Yeah, we had a statement from the White House last night when we were putting out this reporting where you know, they basically say that anything short of what Congress, what they are asking Congress to do will not suffice. And I think that's to go ahead and lay out a marker that they aren't expecting a silver bullet here. What they want was this bill. But now that it's done, we're hearing that they are obviously looking at other options. They, what we were told by sources is they absolutely cannot sit by and do nothing, but they don't want to be graded against the accomplishments that that bill would have provided. In other words, if they roll something out and the numbers remain high at the southern border and you continue to see cities like New York, Chicago, and Denver be overwhelmed, they don't want someone to come along and say, well, I guess what they did didn't work. So, Julia, it seems unlikely we're going to see any movement on the border from Congress before the elections this November. What's the possible timeline here for this decision on possible executive actions? So it depends on exactly what route they go. Right now, we know that it's still in a discussion and drafting phase. So first, they have to get through that. If they do something like a reg, like a regulation they have to publish in the Federal Register, that could be months. They would have to get public comment. But oftentimes, those will carry more weight. Um, but an executive action could be something where the president simply uh, puts out a memo t instructing ICE to do something in a certain way. It could even be a memo that would come from Secretary Mayorkas at Homeland Security himself. So it depends on what path they take. They could try to do something more immediate. But really, anything a president does on immigration can be unwound by future administrations. And we've seen that time and time again. All right. Julia Ainsley, thank you so much.
The U.S. military has carried out another strike in the Middle East. American forces are continuing to retaliate against Iran-aligned militias after three U.S. soldiers were killed in a drone attack nearly two weeks ago. U.S. Central Command says in a drone strike in Baghdad, it killed a senior commander of the group, Qatab of Hezbollah. He was in a vehicle along with two others, and all three were killed. NBC's Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us from Washington. Peter, walk us through what we know about this U.S. strike and this senior leader who was killed. Yeah, Joe, this is significant. It is the first precision strike by the United States against a high-value target inside of Baghdad, Iraq. As you noted in the setup to this conversation, this individual is believed by the U.S. to be one of the senior commanders of, as you note, Kataib Hezbollah, which is not the Hezbollah group you know in Lebanon, but it is an Iranian-backed militia group that the U.S. says is responsible for many of those attacks on U.S. targets across the Middle East in the course of the last several months. Dating back to October at the start of the Israel-Hamas war, there have been more than 166 strikes on U.S. targets, including forces across that region, including one just a couple of weeks ago that killed three American service members. And the U.S. has been more forceful in its response here. The strike was dramatic. It incinerated a vehicle that this commander was inside, as well as two other individuals. At the time, it didn't appear that any other cars in the area were impacted by it. You can see some of the pictures there. Iran was, of course, not notified of it. Iraq also wasn't notified of it. And one of the leaders of the armed services there, a spokesperson, has expressed real concerns about the way the U.S. is conducting this retaliation, saying, among other things, quote, that it threatens civil peace, violates Iraqi sovereignty, and risks the lives of our people. He added that it pushes the Iraqi government to end the mission of this U.S.-led coalition, which has become a factor of instability for Iraq and threatens to drag Iraq into the circle of conflict. Again, that is the condemnation from the Iraqi leadership right now to the U.S. strikes there. For his part, President Biden has said this is part of what will be a continuing effort to target those responsible for attacking American forces in the region, Joe. Yeah, so Peter, I guess that's the question. Are more strikes planned? Do we have an idea how long this campaign could last? Well, we can't say for sure how long it's going to last, but it's clear it's going to be more than days. We're now already in at least the second week here of these American strikes, and there really is sort of a dual effort that we are witnessing here, Joe. Right on the one hand, you have the American forces across that region trying to target those who are believed to be responsible for those attacks on installations that house U.S. forces across the region, specifically in places like Iraq and Syria. And then on the other hand, as we've been reporting over the course of the last several weeks, there is an effort by this administration to crack down on the Iranian-backed Houthi uh, militants, Houthi rebels who are from Yemen who have been targeting commercial ships, including American commercial ships, in the Red Sea right now. The concern there is the impact that could have on commercial shipping. It could create some real supply chain disruptions. So the U.S. is juggling not just what's going on between Israel and Hamas right now, but also what's going on throughout the wider region, while the president, Joe, has made very clear that he is doing everything in his power, he says, to avoid this from escalating into a wider war, something he says he does not want to see happen. All right. Peter, good to see you this morning. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk more about that. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapped up his visit to the Middle East yesterday without a ceasefire. He was unable to push forward negotiations that would have secured the release of hostages from Gaza. Yesterday, Blinken sat down with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss a range of topics, including aid to Gaza and the ceasefire proposal introduced by Hamas. That counterproposal included a pathway to return displaced Gazans to their homes and a three-year plan to rebuild Gaza, which leaves Hamas in charge of the enclave. Dashing any hopes for a deal anytime soon, Netanyahu called the plan delusional during a press briefing yesterday. But Blinken says there is still room for negotiations moving forward. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. And we will work at that relentlessly until we get there. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest on these negotiations. Matt, good morning. So walk us through Blinken's meeting with both Palestinian and Israeli leaders yesterday. And what are you hearing from Hamas leaders about this deal? 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds as though Blinken had meetings where he discussed all of this, especially these hostage negotiations, but it's looking like he's leaving and he's going home empty handed. This was the big win for this trip. And according to Israeli leaders, this was the reason why he came in order to secure this deal that, if you remember, was hashed out with American help. The head of the CIA, actually, who was in Paris a week and a half ago, meeting with his counterparts from the Middle East, trying to get to a deal that now Hamas has rejected and Israel has rejected. So this is not really going to go very well. Uh, it could take weeks or months for another negotiated deal. Uh, but the, the people of Gaza and the hostages don't really have that kind of time. When I spoke with a Hamas official yesterday, he said that he wasn't really expecting that the Israelis were going to accede to the deal that they presented as their counteroffer. He thinks the Israeli object ob objective in the Gaza Strip is to displace all of the Palestinian people there and to take it over. And he said this is according to what he's heard, what we've all heard from right-wing cabinet ministers, but Benjamin Netanyahu himself has denied that that is the objective. But you can see the depth of the enmity and bad blood between these both sides. These, it just makes negotiations really difficult to move forward. Guys. So, Matt, yesterday, I mean, we actually heard from a group of former hostages who were released from Gaza. They held a news conference following Netanyahu's briefing. What are they saying? And how is the prime minister's dismissal of Hamas's counterproposal just being received in Israel right now? Yeah, well, the prime minister is on the sharp edge of these hostages' families and the former hostages' anger. They blame the prime minister personally for continuing the war. And I got to tell you, for some context here, in terms of the politics, it increasingly looks like, and a lot of Israelis and a lot of Israeli leaders feel, that the two goals of this war are in complete, uh, basically, uh, objects to each other. They're, they're totally opposites. They're working at odds. One objective is to destroy Hamas. One objective is to free the hostages. A lot of folks here believe they just don't, they can't accomplish both. And so that's why these hostages, uh, the former hostages and family members of hostages, they held this tearful meeting where they said, time is running out. If these hostages aren't uh, freed, if the war doesn't stop and Hamas's demands aren't met, then there might not be any hostages left alive to save. And indeed, we heard that just a couple of days ago from the New York Times, they broke the story from the Israelis saying that they believe that about a fifth of the hostages are believed to have died ever since October 7th. Some of them from the wounds they incurred on October 7th, others from Israeli attacks. And it's important to note here, that the Israeli incursion into the Gaza Strip has killed more than 27,000 Palestinians. It has only freed one hostage. All of the hostages that have been freed have been done through negotiations like the ones that are failing right now. All right, Matt Bradley in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you so much. On the West Coast, millions of Americans still under flood watches. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather with meteorologist Angie Lastman. Angie, good morning. Good morning, Joe. We're starting to see some of those expire across portions of California, and we've got most of that rain working out, and we'll see some drier conditions for folks cleaning up there. We've got some rain that we're tracking across parts of the upper Midwest and some snow out west on those mountain ranges there. Let's start with the winter alerts out west. Uh, we've got the winter storm warnings and the winter weather advisories in effect for a good chunk of the country as this system starts to work its way east. We'll pick up some additional snow across, across parts of the Rockies and not to mention the northern plains as well. We'll see some of that rain working through through the day today. And then we really start to ramp up our rain chances as we get into the weekend. Here's a look at tomorrow. It's mainly the rain that we're focusing from the Tennessee Valley out towards the Carolinas. We'll see some quieter conditions take shape across the Midwest as that snow tapers off. But then we start to see our rain chances ramping up once again as we get into Saturday. Here's a look at the southeast. This is the spot that we're going to watch for some of that uh, impactful rain, not to mention beneficial. But of course, this may impact some of those Saturday plans that you have across this region. It'll stick with us for at least your Saturday and move through by Sunday. Here's a look at the snowfall forecast as we get through at least the end of the work week. We could pick up another six to eight inches in some of those higher elevations with some of those higher amounts. Uh, so ski resorts, happy about that. Uh, but travel will still be difficult on those mountain roads. As far as the rainfall is concerned, uh, you know, an inch to two inches up to three inches across a good section of the southeast here for Friday through Sunday. This is your weekend uh, kind of bullseye for the rain. So we'll watch for some low 
localized flooding concerns. And then we turn our attention to this system moving from the southeast into the northeast. It's going to gain a little bit of strength as it moves across parts of the lower Mississippi. So we will uh, start to see some of these stronger storms developing as we get into Sunday for places like Texas, Louisiana, right along that Gulf Coast. We'll watch for uh, that to impact your Sunday. And then notice as we get into Monday, the storm lifts a little farther to the north. It'll encounter some cooler air. So we will see places like the interior northeast in parts of New England picking up some additional snowfall right now. Uh, too hard to tell exactly what those accumulations will look like, but we could see some light to moderate snow. At least that's what it looks like right now. Otherwise, plenty of rain in the picture for folks along the I-95 corridor. It'll mostly be a rain event, and especially as we get back into our next work week. But the good news is by Tuesday, all of that's out of the picture. But you know what happens with that, Joe? That cooler wind comes in behind it and all the warm temperatures we're expecting in that region over the next couple of days, it'll be uh, replaced with some chillier conditions. Spring will be sure over is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, the taste of spring that we're getting. That's a good way to put it. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate Thanks. it. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, sticker shock in Sin City. Football fans flocking to Vegas ahead of Super Bowl Sunday. But watching the big game comes with a big price tag. We're going to add up the costs. Up first, developing news. Several people are missing following a house fire and a shooting that injured two police officers in Pennsylvania. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are following a developing story this morning out of Pennsylvania. At least six people, including kids, are missing after a house fire and shooting that injured two police officers. It happened yesterday in East Lansdowne, just outside of Philadelphia. Police were responding to a report of an 11-year-old girl being shot. When they arrived on the scene, a gunman inside a home opened fire shooting both officers. The home caught fire a short time later while the gunman was inside. Investigators say at least six to eight people living in that home are currently unaccounted for. NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now from East Lansdowne with the latest. So George, do police have any idea where these people are and how do they investigate this crime scene after that massive fire? Yeah, good morning, Joe. First things first, that raging inferno now under control. Those firefighters unable to knock it down yesterday afternoon because there were those concerns about an active shooter. Now, this morning, officials are actually gearing up to go inside the home to begin that search for the shooter or shooters and those unaccounted family members. Our fears are maybe multiple people inside that home uh, who, have, who have died. We don't know yet whether or not we can confirm or deny that until we get inside and methodically go through uh, the debris that that house is now. Yeah, Joan, we're also expecting a further update from officials this morning. Once those investigators are actually able to get inside the home, we actually got a pretty good glimpse of it from the other side. It is a complete shell of what it was, and you can imagine other people around this raging fire are also now displaced. Now, those two officers that were shot, we're told they're veterans of the force, and they are expected to make a full recovery. Meanwhile, people here in this community, of course, shot. They are waiting for answers, especially when you know that there might be some children that are still unaccounted for. Officials hoping to provide us an update and provide further details on what could be a very grim discovery here this morning, Joe. Yeah, George, I mean, I understand the entire block was evacuated yesterday. Have people been able to return to their homes? And what else are you hearing from those who live in the neighborhood about all this? Yeah, Joe, there are still some road closures in the area, but people that live here in the immediate area are able to return home. And we're starting to see people sort of trickle in here to begin looking at some of the damage, some of the debris here. And, of course, they are concerned, many of them not really providing a whole lot of insight into who may have lived there. We are hearing anecdotally that it seems that a lot of people we're living at this home. So we are digging through that as part of this investigation. And again, investigators hoping to provide a bit more context because again, at this point, they're saying that whoever the shooter or shooters may have been, looks like they retreated inside of the home during that massive, massive fire that burned here for hours. And as you mentioned, folks here were displaced for a few hours. So many of them eager for answers, Joe. All right, George, we know you'll stay honest. Thank you so much. Coming up, a historic Hawaii neighborhood reduced to rubble. An NBC News investigation six months after the devastating Maui fires on the area now known as ground zero for the tragedy when we return. Plus, hospitals overcrowded and overwhelmed, but a new program could offer some relief in the emergency room. We're going to explain next on Morning News Now. 
Welcome back. It has been six months since devastating wildfires tore through the Maui town of Lahaina. Now an NBC News investigation into what went wrong reveals at least 43 of the fire's 100 victims lived in one small neighborhood, trapped with no way out. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson reports. You look and, you know, you see that house on fire, that house on fire. Above the ruined remnants of Lahaina, Anthony Steele remembers those awful August flames. This was gridlock, this line on the road. <laughs> and for so many, the narrow escape. You need to go, bro. Yeah, go, go, go. The lifelong Maui resident lost three family-owned properties, his job, and the only place he's ever called home on August 8th. Steele says he's lucky he has his life. Many of his closest neighbors died that day, including his tenant and close family friend, Bernie Portabes. Do you remember the last thing he said to me? I'll drive you wherever we gotta go. He, said, he just told me that he did, he's gonna stay a bit longer. It's very hard. Something I gotta live with, you know. An NBC News investigation discovered Portabes and at least 42 others who died in the Maui wildfires all lived in the same small neighborhood within Lahaina, a neighborhood of narrow streets and tight turns. You couldn't get a fire truck through my neighborhood, not on those sharp turns with everybody parking all horribly, you know. Satellite photos taken after the smoke cleared revealed a deadly bottleneck after a downed tree blocked one of the few ways out. We just can't get out. There's yeah. no way out. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, they're working on the fire. I, all I can tell you is to get out of that area. The area, called Kahua Camp, was the remnant of once temporary housing built for workers growing sugarcane. The home's average size originally were only like 500 square feet. Crystal Smythe grew up in Kuhua Camp and says as families grew, so did the homes, and the neighborhood got more congested. It was already a one-lane road. They started parking on the streets because the homes were adding second stories. Some were adding cottages in the back. So it became more and more dangerous that way. NBC News spoke to more than 30 people, including current and former residents of Kahua Camp, to understand why it came to account for so many of the fire's fatalities. For years, residents say they complained about access issues, cars and boats blocking the streets, some fearing they may one day face the unthinkable. We're trapped right now. We're trapped. Then they did. Yo. Maui County officials declined to comment on the neighborhood's long-running congestion and access problems. Though a spokesperson for the police department confirmed a dispatcher notified officers of a downed tree in the area, but said officers were busy elsewhere and it was not addressed. What does this kind of loss do to a community like this? It's definitely wounded. You are never, ever going to be the same. I know will never be the same. I know that for a fact. He does hope it can be safer one day when he rebuilds. We just want to go home. We can't go home, though. Our thanks to Steve Patterson for that report. Now to an ongoing issue facing hospitals across the country. It's called boarding. So what does that mean? Well, boarding happens when patients go to the emergency room and are held there for hours, in some cases waiting up to 24 hours before they're seen. But now a new program may offer a better solution that starts at home. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson explains. A new heart gave Marissa Long new life eight years ago and plenty of experience in the ER, but stays in hospital hallways for 48 and then 72 hours for rejection issues last winter were frightening. I'm immunocompromised, so I could like catch something in there and make things worse. Disturbing for the 30 year old and her dad, Michael. We go in thinking that we're moving to a room or some level of standard of care for a transplant patient in trouble and literally we get stuck in the ER. It's not just in Los Angeles where they live. In a recent national survey, 97% of emergency room doctors reported waiting times of more than 24 hours for a hospital bed. Now a potential solution, hospital at home programs. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, ma'am? I'm doing well, Manny. Like this one run by Atrium Health in North Carolina. Let me listen to your lungs here really quick. Sit up for me. Again. Excellent. 
Typically, 80-year-old Florence Sparks would be hospitalized for congestive heart failure, but instead, she's at home. I'm getting better care here. How is it better? Well, I think they're more attentive. They're not rushed to see another patient. They're, they give you their undivided attention like Manny just did. Manny Mills, a community paramedic, visits twice a day. Sparks well, sees a doctor bad. over a provided iPad once a day. I think it's going up on the laces. Oh, the laces, okay. Uh, going to twice a day on it. And a nurse twice. They can also provide ready-made meals. Care that's more comfortable for patients and more informative for caregivers, says Mills. You really get a 360 view of a patient's life. Absolutely. We get to see their environment. We get to see what they eat, what they drink. And that enables you to deliver better care? 1,000%. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, um, and, of course, medically. In the garage where hospital-at-home paramedics load up, Colleen Hole, who heads the program, says it's treating as many as 60 people a day at home, reducing costs up to 25% and resulting in fewer readmissions for some 150 diagnoses. We've got cancer, post-op surgical, women's health. Is this the future of health care? Absolutely is. We will always need hospitals. This provides, I believe, ultimately at a lower cost, a place for patients to heal in their own space. Achieving better outcomes, she says. I'm going to see you this afternoon, okay? I look forward to it. For everyone involved. Ann Thompson, NBC News, Charlotte. Coming up, Super Bowl splurge. Football fans forced to pay big bucks for the big game. When we come back, we're going to take you to Las Vegas, where some visitors are complaining about the high roller costs. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Let's get to some financial headlines. It looks like Disney is investing some big money in the future of its streaming service. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. You know, ahead of Disney's earnings yesterday, we thought it was all going to be about that ESPN deal with Fox and, and Warner. Well, there was so much more. Fortnite, football, and of course, Taylor Swift, because she's involved in everything. Disney slaying is laying out a vision to boost its fortunes, pushing further into American pop culture, which includes a deal to invest one and a half billion dollars in Epic Games, which is the maker of Fortnite, expanding the licensing of characters from Disney franchises like Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar and Avatar. Disney's also going to stream an exclusive cut of Taylor Swift's Eras Tour concert movie on Disney Plus starting on March 15th. And former Alabama football coach Nick Saban will join ESPN as an analyst on College Game Day and the NFL Draft. A lot going on there. Meantime, Disney Plus wants to stay friends with Percy Jackson. The streaming service is renewing Percy Jackson and the Olympians for a second season. Disney announcing the pickup during its quarterly earnings call. There was a lot to talk about yesterday. The first season of that show had a solid start when it debuted in late December, with Disney Plus reporting more than 13 million views worldwide over the first week of the first episode. It was the biggest launch for a Disney Plus series not associated with Marvel or Star Wars. In other news, Need a little help finding Cupid's arrow this Valentine's Day? Open Table has recommendations on the most romantic restaurants around the country, releasing its annual top 100 list. It analyzes customer reviews and other metrics, including the number of times a restaurant is tagged as romantic. California apparently has the most places on the list with 12, followed by Florida with seven. About 70% of diners say they plan to shell out more on Valentine's Day meals this year than they did last year. But I think anytime you go out these days, you spend more. It's just its just a higher cost. <laughs> it is now. a given. I wonder, like, when people say romantic, is it just like candlelight? Is that basically what does it? Or if there's some other factors involved there? I think sometimes like a view, I think of some restaurants I've been to in California where you just have an amazing view of the ocean and, you know, it's just lovely to sit there and gaze into one another's eyes, but then also look at that view. There you go. Yeah. Of course, there's the company to that place in important role. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Excitement is building for Super Bowl 58, where the 49ers will take on the Chiefs Sunday in Las Vegas. Fans are already flocking to Sin City to take in all the action, but it's not going to be cheap. 
cheap. This is shaping up to be one of the most expensive and lavish Super Bowls in history. Our Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Las Vegas with more on all the opulent details. Kaylee, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. All week I've been here telling you that the party was already rolling in Las Vegas, but just like Usher, I have a confession. I need to recalibrate for you. I am going to say at Monday, the city was at a four. Now it's at an eight. And with the opening of the Super Bowl experience right here, it's becoming even more clear that by Sunday, this place is going to be off the charts. Let's go Niners! Super Bowl excitement is surging in Sin City. Football fans from all over the country getting in on the action at the Super Bowl experience as they test their skills and run some drills. Do you have a touchdown dance for me? Oh! Look at her go! All week, the clash between the 49ers and the Chiefs has lit up Vegas. Now, with just three days until kickoff, ticket sales are spiking. The price for a single seat at Allegiant Stadium averaging nearly 9,000 bucks. Are you going to the game? We can't afford it. Neither can I. <laughs> and no one does luxury like Las Vegas. Welcome to one of our luxury suites. There they are, ladies. This is the seat I would like to have. This is how high rollers will watch Super Bowl 58 in style. 146 private suites, some going for more than a million dollars. That hefty price tag, even giving fan favorite Mama Kelsey some sticker shock when she joined the Today Team. I have a feeling I'm not in a box. I have a feeling I'm in the stands. <laughs> for those who can score a box seat, you'll have prime views of the action, unlimited drinks, and a menu fit for a Super Bowl champion. What can ticket holders get here that you can't get anywhere else? So you're getting a lobster, you're getting steak, you're getting sushi. It's just over the top. Because that's what Vegas does best. Of course. But even those who won't be one of the lucky 60,000 inside Allegiant Stadium on game day are getting ready for it. Swifties gearing up for themed Super Bowl parties and prop bets inspired by the pop star. The sports betting website Bet Online has 89 Swift related wagers, including how many seconds will Swift be shown on TV and will boyfriend Travis Kelsey propose post game? A question the tight ends skillfully dodged on Wednesday. Who's getting a ring first, the Niners or the <laughs> I'm hoping I get this ring on Sunday. I know that. In all, a record $23 billion in gambling wagers is expected this year. And fans are going all in. What do you think the final score of this game is going to be? Uh, Chiefs 50 and 49ers 0. Oh, okay. <sighs> that is a true fan right there. Now, keeping with this theme of everything in Las Vegas being more extravagant, Joe, brace yourself. Usher has revealed that his halftime show is going to be two minutes longer than previous shows. And he's confirmed there will be special guests. We don't know who yet, but get ready for it. He's also gotten some advice from past performers, including Katy Perry. So yes, 15 minutes of hits and some surprises, Joe. Oh my gosh, that's always one of the best parts of the halftime show is who is gonna show up. Looking forward to that. Kaylee, thank you, appreciate it. Coming up from the Grammy stage to a Brooklyn museum, singer Alicia Keys is sharing her love for art by putting her private collection on display. We're gonna show you the new exhibit after the break. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. You might know Lil Jon from his hit song, Turn Down For What? Well, now the rapper is turning it down for something unexpected. Meditation. Yeah, the king of crunk, known for his party jams, is releasing a new guided meditation album. It says the new project is a result of his recent focus on fitness and wellness. This comes just after another rapper, Andre 3000, released an album of ambient instrumental music last year. Lil Jon's 10-track album, Total Meditation, is set to drop a week from Friday. Do you know what other singer loves meditation? Alicia Keys, and she has a lot to celebrate these days. On Sunday night, she won her 16th Grammy. Now she's launching another major project here in New York with her husband, music producer Swizz Beats. They've been collecting hundreds of pieces of art together for years. Now they're letting the public in on their collection. Today, anchor Hoda Kotb sat down with them at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> Grammy award-winning singer Alicia Keys and her husband, Kasim Dean, better known as music producer Swizz Beats, are unveiling something big. You've <laughs> never seen anything like this, period. Something giant. When you walk, walk in, in the, the room, what happens? Oof. I don't know. Strikes. Either just the culmination of, like, 
the vision of the Dean Collection and being able to see all of the beautiful works. For the first time, more than 100 works from the couple's private art collection called the Dean Collection are on display at the Brooklyn Museum. This is a portion of our collection that we've been collecting for the past 20 years. The exhibition, titled Giants, features works of nearly 40 black artists from all over the world, much of it not only colossal in size, but also in meaning. It's very rare you see artists of color um, displaying 30-foot works. So when, when people walk into the show, we want them to feel, you know, like we can be as, as giant as we want to be. It's meant to also remind you that you belong in these spaces. Mm. You belong here. Mm. We deserve to be on all the walls <laughs> of all the giant spaces. And that, I think, is maybe what just hit me in the gut just now. Mm. There's something about this collection that is special and different. It's more than what you would see when you go to a museum and see beautiful art. I think, one, we, we, we collect from our heart. You know, mm. it's not transactional for us. All of the artists that's living, that's in the show, are actual friends. They come to our house, some stay at our house. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. So they're friends. They're not just an artist no. who you admired from afar. That's right. No, I like that. It's more of a welcome to the family. One of those artists the deans count as a close friend is Kahinde Wiley. In 2018, with his iconic portrait of President Barack Obama, Wiley became the first African-American artist to paint an official U.S. presidential portrait for the Smithsonian. You've been to the White House. You've been all over the world. Tell me what this meant, being asked to commission these pieces for Alicia Keys. Sure. And Swiss. You know, this was a much more personal experience. Mm. Swizz and Alicia are friends, and they believe in art deeply. Well, what they're doing is they're normalizing a love affair with art. The deans are also spotlighting emerging artists like Qualicia Wood. This piece, Genesis, um, is a jacquard weaving. Just a few years ago, Wood got a life-changing phone call. So you were in Cheesecake Factory. Yes. You heard that Swizz Beats liked your art. I so screamed. That, so you screamed. It, I think it just felt like the I arrived moment, you know? Uh. At the heart of the Dean's collection is the couple's shared passion for collecting, supporting, and building community among artists, especially artists of color. This just looks like fun. I know. Can we just have fun over here? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, we missed this. This one was in the house. And it's something they hope to pass on to their two boys, Egypt and Genesis. I was just thinking most kids on the wall have like either posters or pictures of themselves. You're like, no, 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 we're gonna put up art for our kids to admire. What were you hoping to teach your children through putting art on the walls? I don't think our kids know who's on the wall. <laughs> right? You know, because it's not a forced thing. You know, like <laughs> them seeing this show, they're gonna naturally wanna right. dig deeper. Now, with some of their most treasured pieces on display, the couple hopes to make a lasting impact on the art world for their own kids and for future generations to come. Look what you've created, you. what you've built, what you've just what you've done. We get one ride around the sun. That's it. I agree with that. And look how you're spending yours. Wow. This is something. When you're a little kid and you have all these dreams in your head, you don't even know what's even possible. Mm. And, mm. And, and hopefully this being a, 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 a way for all of us to discover what's possible, that we can build and create at the largest scales is, is a reminder because there's, there's times in your life where you don't feel that's possible. And so to see it happen, you know it can happen for anybody. Our thanks to Hoda for that report. Giants, art from the Dean Collection of Swizz Beats and Alicia Keys is open to the public starting Saturday at the Brooklyn Museum. It's going to do it for this hour of morning news now, but stay with us. The news continues right now.
Good Thursday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment right now on Morning News Now Supreme Court showdown this morning. Former President Trump's efforts to get his name back in White House contention in Colorado. It heads to the Supreme Court. The landmark legal back and forth over Mr. Trump in January 6 that could shake up November's election in the Middle East. America's retaliatory strikes against Iran backed militants continues. The top commander linked to attacks on U.S. troops is killed in a drone strike in Baghdad. It comes as Secretary of State Antony Blinken pushes forward with ceasefire talks, meeting with both Israel's prime minister and the Palestinian president. We're on the ground with the latest as Hamas proposes its own post-war plans. Also this hour, we're digging into a landmark new study on being transgender in the U.S., how the overwhelming majority of trans Americans say they feel after transitioning. Plus, it was a communication craze that revolutionized the way we talk to each other. But now in 2024, it seems as though the humble old school landline is singing its swan song, but some die hard dial tone nostalgics aren't ready to drop the call just yet. Good to have you with us. We begin this hour with a landmark case making its way to the Supreme Court today. The justices will hear arguments about a Colorado ruling that excludes former President Trump from the state's March primary ballot, citing the 14th Amendment. The decision Trump has now appealed to the high court. The Colorado Supreme Court said his role in the January 6th insurrection makes him ineligible to hold office. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has a preview of today's hearing. Good morning. For a long time, this case was viewed as something of a legal long shot, really just an academic exercise, all until the Colorado decision changed everything. And now that the high court has agreed to hear this case, the ultimate decision is far from certain. This morning, a legal case that could rock the race for the White House, now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Former President Donald Trump hoping to reverse an unprecedented decision. Colorado going where no state had gone before. Disqualifying the Republican frontrunner from the primary ballot this year, all because of his actions in the last election. We fight like hell. In a four to three decision, the Colorado Supreme Court finding Mr. Trump ineligible to run for president under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which disqualifies any officer of the United States who takes an oath to support the Constitution and then engages in insurrection from holding public office again. Krista Kafer is a conservative columnist who voted for Mr. Trump in 2020, but now one of the six voters serving as plaintiffs in Colorado. For someone who might look at this and say, Krista, why don't I just let the voters decide? What do you say to that? Former President Trump didn't want to let the voters decide, right? He tried to disenfranchise 80 million Americans that had voted for Biden. Mr. Trump's lawyers argue the 14th Amendment's disqualification clause shouldn't apply to him at all, predicting, quote, chaos and bedlam if the high court doesn't rule in his favor. I really believe they're going to leave the people to vote. Colorado and Maine outliers among the majority of states that rejected or dodged the wave of lawsuits to kick Mr. Trump off the ballot in recent months. A new poll finding Americans divided on the issue, with 41 percent supporting the efforts to disqualify the former president, 36 opposed to it. While on paper this case is just about Colorado, the ultimate end result from the U.S. Supreme Court likely to apply to all 50 states. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. For more on today's hearing, we're joined by NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sinadella. Good to have you with us. So a couple arguments we're dissecting here. Let's start with this insurrection clause, which says basically it applies to people who served as, quote, officers of the United States. Trump's lawyers are arguing that doesn't even include the president. Talk about the arguments here. Yes, so that is a very specific textual argument. And in that clause, it labels certain other offices, and then it says, and any other office, and it doesn't explicitly include the presidency. So we have Trump's team here saying, if the founding fathers, when they made this amendment, wanted to, it's not the founding fathers, sorry, this happened around Civil War, if those people wanted to include this, the presidency, they would have explicitly labeled it. And the fact that it doesn't include it means that he should be qualified to run for president. Then on the other side, though, we have Colorado's 
saying obviously any public office includes the presidency. The other question here is whether Trump even engaged in an insurrection, and that's going to be one of the arguments here, whether he did or didn't, right? Yes, exactly. So that, I think, is going to be the heart of it. We have these Colorado justices who decided, quite obviously, he engaged in insurrection, and they outlined the steps he took, and they believe it qualifies. But then we have Trump's team saying that in spite of all of these legal troubles that he is embroiled in, not one prosecutor has dared to charge him with insurrection, which means that it's a high bar to clear. So how dare the Supreme Court then kick him off the ballot without anybody, any jury of his peers, determining that he had committed insurrection. So there are a lot of possibilities here for the Supreme Court. Lay out what they could choose to do here. Yes, so I actually think big picture, though, they're going to look at voter disenfranchisement, which is what Trump's team is going to hammer down. And then on the other side, states' right, if Colorado should have the right to do this themselves, if the Supreme Court cannot definitively say that the Constitution is being violated here. So the options are it goes back to the states, and each state can decide themselves whether or not he's going to be kicked off the ballot or the Supreme Court says under no circumstance may President Trump be kicked off the ballot, or then, of course, they can always have wiggle room and say maybe not now, maybe it's about holding office, running for office, so it remains to be seen. All right, lots of possibilities. Quite the year we're having here. Angela Sinadella, thanks for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. This morning, Iraq is condemning the United States, saying America violated its sovereignty. This after the U.S. carried out a drone strike in Baghdad yesterday. The U.S. military says that it killed a senior commander of the Iran-aligned group that it blames for the drone attack that killed three U.S. soldiers in Jordan more than a week ago. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from northern Iraq with the latest. Keir, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. This is the first precision strike against a, a high-value target here in Iraq since those U.S. service members were killed. A U.S. government official telling NBC News that Iraq was only informed of the strike after it had happened, it comes as the U.S., frankly, battles to try to reach a, a diplomatic solution to the war between Hamas and Israel. This morning, new details emerging of a deadly U.S. strike inside Baghdad. A precision drone incinerating a vehicle, killing three. An assassination so targeted, cars close by appear undamaged. Among those killed, Abu Bakr al-Sa'adi, one of the leaders of an Iranian-backed militia accused of a drone attack on a U.S. base that left three servicemen and women dead. President Biden ordering the strike early last week, a U.S. official telling NBC News. Last night, the official says, the opportunity presented itself. U.S. Central Command saying in a statement, U.S. forces conducted a unilateral strike in Iraq in response to the attacks on U.S. service members. But in the aftermath, a furious crowd chanting no to America, no to Israel. While the militia targeted last night, vowing revenge and promising more missile attacks. Kurdistan's prime minister in Iraq, a U.S. partner who helped fight ISIS, says there are still threats in the region and America must not walk away. We have always been in the uh, forefront of uh, fighting terrorism as friends, as allies, that we need to be capable enough. You need American support for that? We do need American support for that. The ongoing war in Gaza escalating tensions in the region with no signs of a ceasefire. A Hamas proposal that included the release of large numbers of Palestinian prisoners firmly rejected by Israel's Prime Minister, even with US Secretary of State Blinken in the country. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. And Joe, those numbers from Gaza and Israel now, 27,708 dead in Gaza, according to the health ministry in Gaza, which Gaza, of course, is ruled by Hamas, more than 1,200 dead in Israel, 136 hostages in Gaza still, including uh, as many as six U.S. citizens, Joe. Just heartbreaking.
Definitely. All right, Keir Simmons, thank you so much. Let's continue this conversation with the former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Avi Mayer. We're on what's next in the more. Avi, thanks for joining us. So, so Netanyahu says there is no end to this war without a victory for Israel, when so far as to call this counter-proposal introduced by Hamas delusional. Secretary Blinken seems to find some parts of it workable. So despite Netanyahu's comments, is there a feeling that something can still be negotiated here? So I think there are many Israelis, the majority even, who want there to be some kind of a hostage deal in order to bring those 136 Israelis home. Um, there seems to be a significant difference of opinion on what would be an acceptable deal. Um, but there actually is an agreement between Israel and the United States that there are elements of Hamas's proposal that are simply unacceptable. Um, we understand that those negotiations are going to continue today in Cairo with the goal of reaching some kind of an agreement. Um, but we understand that one of the particular sticking points points in Hamas's proposal is the release of 500 terrorists with what we call blood on their hands. That is, people who were convicted of actively murdering Israelis. That is something that is igniting a great deal of controversy in Israel and something the prime minister himself has said that he will not allow. We'll have to see what the days in uh, head store. Yeah. So is Netanyahu running the risk of losing some degree of support from the U.S. and from other nations in the region trying to broker some sort of deal? What's his capital right now? Look, right now, again, he's under tremendous pressure domestically to bring about the release of those hostages. There were two press conferences last night that got a lot of attention, his and the secretary's, but there was a third one as well. Five of the former hostages, these women who were released by Hamas as part of one of the previous deals, spoke about the imperative of reaching an agreement as soon as possible in order to bring those hostages home. So there's a great deal, a groundswell, I would say, of support in Israel for such a deal. Um, and he finds himself pushing back against it in order to ensure that the IDF is able to complete its mission of decimating Hamas's capability of ever carrying out a massacre like October 7th ever again. I think ultimately there will be an agreement. I don't know how long it'll take. We understand these negotiations are ongoing. We'll see what the coming days hold. You mentioned this groundswell. We've been talking about that that news conference with the former hostages. Is there a feeling that Netanyahu is impacted or, or listening to that groundswell right now? I think he certainly is. I mean, the fact that he was compelled to speak about this publicly, the fact that he held up one of those iconic dog tags that many Israelis have been wearing in solidarity with the hostages and their families is an indication that he is hearing the support of so many Israelis for some kind of a hostage deal. I don't think that we'll be able to go much longer without such a deal being effectuated. Ultimately, however, much of the ball really is in Hamas's court. Um, we have to understand these are Again, terrorists who've been convicted of heinous, heinous crimes, if they insist on their release, that will be a significant impediment for any kind of potential deal. All right. Avi Mayer, thanks so, for so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Turn now to Pennsylvania, where officials say at least six people, including children, are unaccounted for after a house fire and shooting near Philadelphia that injured two police officers. NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now from East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, with more on this. George, good morning. Joe, good morning. Authorities able to knock down the fire. Keep in mind they were unable to do so for several hours after there were some concerns. There may have been an active shooter inside. You might be able to see behind me that authorities now here on the ground beginning to mobilize to go inside of that home to find the shooter or shooters and those unaccounted family members. This morning, at least six people missing and two police officers shot after a tragic scene in a Philadelphia suburb. There's an 11 year old shot inside. Authorities say two officers were responding to a 911 call around 4 p.m. reporting an 11-year-old girl was shot at this house. A gunman inside then opened fire on officers. Shots are coming from inside the house. Two officers shot. Shortly before, the house caught on fire, leaving at least six members of the family inside unaccounted for. And then all of a sudden, I heard six or seven gunshots. Cop the cop down on the ground, I ran. It's a call. Two officers were struck and were dragged out of danger, sustaining non-life-threatening injuries. During the chaotic exchange of gunfire, a fire erupted inside the home. Officials say firefighters were unable to put out the blaze because of the active shooter situation. The, the police officers in the fire department who were out there, there were still shots coming out at the beginning of this uh, fire scene. Authorities say they are unable to identify the shooter or the missing residents, but say they include children. We are aware that there are at least six to eight people who are unaccounted for from that family. It is our terrible fear that they may be inside that house when it was burned. We are hopeful that that is not true. 
The investigation and search for survivors continuing. Joe, officials are expected to provide us with another update this morning once the investigators are actually able to safely get inside of that home. And those two officers that were wounded, we're told they were veterans of the force and are fortunately expected to make full recoveries. Joe? That at least is good to hear, George. Thank you so much. Now for a check on our morning news now weather. Unseasonably warm conditions continue for much of the country. Angie Lastman joins us now with the forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Spring has sprung, kind of. We've got temperatures that at least feel like it, running 10 to 30 degrees above normal for most of the country, really. We've got temperatures, potential records on deck here as we get into the afternoon hours. Saginaw, Michigan coming in at 58 for the afternoon high, blowing past a record of 55 degrees probably this afternoon. We've got Minneapolis set to break a record. Temperatures in Des Moines expected to head to the low 60s. That would break a record. And Kansas City close to it. And that's going to be kind of the story across this region, not just today, but into tomorrow too. A look at your forecast afternoon highs for tomorrow in Toledo. 62 degrees. We've got Indianapolis set to head to 63 degrees. And even as far east as Harrisburg, we're going to be into the upper 50s. These temperatures, of course, not where we should be for this time of year, but we're going to stick around that kind of same range here for at least the next couple of days. Looking ahead to the weekend in Washington, D.C., 65 degrees on Saturday. That is the day that you're going to want to be outdoors. It'll feel really nice, more like April than February. We do drop back into those low 60s by the time Sunday rolls around, and then we kind of moderate out to where we should be by by the time we get back into our next work week and we could potentially be talking about some rain and some snow across this region by early next week. We've got 30s on tap for Sunday in Cleveland, but notice where we are on Saturday into the mid 50s. So a bit of a temperature roller coaster ride uh, from anywhere from Nashville to Raleigh and up through Boston over the next couple of days and into our weekend. The big picture look today, it looks like we could, like we could see some rain, some snow across portions of the upper Midwest. We've got that mountain snow happening out west. Finally, we're starting to see a little bit of a break when it comes to the rain uh, impacting folks in Southern California. But otherwise, if you're in the southeast today, even in the middle of the country, things are quiet. You're going to see some dry skies. You'll see plenty of sunshine across that region as well. Looking ahead to your Friday, we'll keep the record heat going, as I mentioned. The showers, though, will start to uh, peak into portions of the southeast. And this is just a taste of what's to come by the time Saturday rolls around. No surprise out west. We're still going to be dealing with that snow. For your, for your Friday as we wrap up our work week. But check out Saturday. We still have the snow happening. And as I mentioned, skiers delight. It'll be great across the Rockies. Some fresh snow for folks there. We finally see some sunshine across parts of Southern California. That's going to be uh, really important for folks getting that cleanup underway. But it's the rain, the showers, the thunderstorms that are all on top here for the Southeast for your Saturday plans. The umbrella will be needed. We'll see some of these isolated showers too stretching up into portions of the interior Northeast. And we keep it that way really as we wrap up Sunday across that region. Severe storms possible even as this system kind of gains a little bit of strength and starts to lift to the north by the time we get into our next work week. The snow will still be happening across parts of the middle of the country, specifically the southern plains and central plains, uh, and we keep it quiet even through the weekend out west. Here's what's going on right now. We've got some of that snow that I mentioned and some of the rain across the upper Midwest. A few of those showers have finally started to taper off out into California, but we're still dealing with a little rain in the Southwest and that snow across those Western mountain regions. Here's some of the winter alerts that we still have in effect at this hour. And here's how that system plays out. We're gonna start to see uh, it move a little farther to the East. It takes that rain into the Midwest uh, and into the Southeast over the next couple of days. There's some of it that I mentioned that will be impactful for any Saturday plans that you may have across the lower Mississippi Valley. By the way, we need the rain there, so can't complain too much about that. Just uh, make those, adjust those plans as needed. You notice the snowfall forecast, anywhere from another four inches to eight inches possible. We'll, of course, see some higher amounts in those higher elevations. And then when it comes to the rainfall from Friday to Sunday, a good batch of rain working into the southeast. They need it, like I said. So from Texas all the way into the Carolinas, we could see anywhere from an inch to three inches of rain. It'll be a, a, a little bit of a soaker for you to finish out your weekend. And of course, at the Super Bowl, any Super Bowl plans you may have on Sunday, that could be impacted by that. Uh, as we get through Sunday and into Monday, that's when the system starts to lift to the north and it'll encounter a little bit of cooler air on the, uh, on the backside of it. And that means that we could see the potential for some light to moderate snow happening across portions of New England. It'll be more of a rain event for folks anywhere along the I-95 corridor, closer to the 
coast, I think, is where uh, we'll see that better chance for the rain versus the snow. But of course, people are not going to give up winter just How yet. exciting. <laughs> snow someplace? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know if it'll be a whole lot, but the interior northeast could get a, a good a good batch. Hopefully they enjoy that. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> We've got more, much more to come on this hour of morning news now, including the latest from Capitol Hill on that now stalled border bill that's now got lawmakers searching for answers after some Republicans tanked a bipartisan package. Plus, some breaking news this morning. Those five Marines who were reported missing after their helicopter crash in Southern California are now confirmed dead. We've got the latest on that in a live report up next. Welcome back. Senate Republicans have now officially blocked that bipartisan bill that was supposed to beef up security at the southern border. The shocking reversal put an end to four months of negotiations across the aisle. Now Democrats are pushing forward with a supplemental package that would include aid to Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan. The Senate set to go on a two week recess. It's safe to say the Capitol is in a bit of disarray right now. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now with the latest on all that. Ryan, good morning. Good morning, Joe. I think disarray is the correct word, and there is a long to-do list on Capitol Hill, and Congress really isn't making much progress. The dysfunction is a byproduct of Republicans unwilling to bend on key issues. It led to the breakdown in negotiations around the border, and right now, there is no end in sight. The chaos on Capitol Hill is showing no signs of slowing down. We've struggled. Uh, people know. Less than 24 hours after Republicans effectively killed a bipartisan deal to address the border crisis and provide aid to Ukraine and Israel, the Senate's attempt at a new push to provide the aid without the controversial border provisions is stalled, leaving Congress searching for answers as to what could break the impasse. You think House Republicans are as interested in bipartisanship at this point? Well, what they're going to have to do is show their ability to govern, right? Republicans were under massive outside pressure including from former President Trump to kill the border deal. Lead negotiator and staunch conservative James Lankford speaking out yesterday. I had a popular commentator that told me flat out, if you try to move a bill that solves the border crisis during this presidential year, I will do whatever I can to destroy you. Because I do not want you to solve this during the presidential election. Some in the GOP saying now is the time to focus. And no, we're not going to just pass the buck and say that, oh, any president could walk in and secure the border. I saw former President Trump make that allegation earlier today. Well, with all due respect, that didn't happen in 2017, 18, 19, and 20. House Republicans remain entrenched in their all or nothing position. Most of my voters would love to see this place shut down because they don't think it works for them. The speaker promising things will get better. We're governing here. Sometimes it's messy. As the crisis in places like Eagle Pass, Texas continues. I'm hoping that the federal government will cut a deal and completely stop this madness. But for now, there's no path toward providing assistance. And the hope of Capitol Hill being the source of relief is dwindling. Now, the Senate does plan to take another crack at moving that foreign aid package without the border provisions forward this morning. But even if it passes the Senate, there are no guarantees in the House where Speaker Johnson has already warned he may not be willing to even bring the package to the floor for a vote. Joe. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Now to new developments this morning out of California. Military officials have just confirmed that five missing Marines were killed in a helicopter crash outside of San Diego. The helicopter went missing Tuesday night during a routine training flight. It was found in a remote area covered in snow, making it hard to access. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin. Dana, good morning. I know this is a breaking situation. Just tell us what we're learning right now about this crash. Yeah, Joe, just obviously the worst news that has just come out. The military, the Marines here, confirming via email that all five members of that CH-53 helicopter have been found dead. They have not said when they found them. We know that they found that aircraft yesterday morning, and we were told that they had been searching all night. In this email, there's a statement from Major General Michael Borgschult, the commanding general of the Marine Air, Air, Air Station Wing here in Miramar. He says these pilots and crew members were serving a calling greater than self 
and we're proud to do so. We will forever be grateful for their call to duty and selfless service. To the families of our fallen Marines, we send our deepest condolences and commit to ensuring your support and care during this incredibly difficult time. So obviously a lot of questions, what went wrong, that will likely be the focus, the investigation, but right now the military is trying to inform next of kin and their policy is to wait at least 24 hours until all family members, or at least a member next to kin has been notified for all five deceased members. So just very tragic news hitting us this morning. Joe? Certainly, Dana. This was, of course, a bit of a mystery for the past day when we heard that this helicopter yeah. first went missing. Take us back in time into what happened and anything we're learning, perhaps, about how it crashed or what that investigation will hold. Yeah, so this helicopter left Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, north of Las Vegas, heading here to San Diego, where all five members are based. Sometime after 11.30, the plane, the helicopter disappeared from radar, and that's when the crew started searching. They got the coordinates. They couldn't see anything just because it was dark. There was still that 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 winter weather that was rolling through, so it made the search difficult. They started searching at first light, and around 9 o'clock, Yesterday morning, they found that airplane. They had not confirmed whether they found the Marines, but as we've learned, they have found them, and unfortunately, they are deceased. It's unclear what caused this crash, but they will likely look into weather as a potential factor because there was rain, there was rain wind, and snow in the area during that time. Joe? Of course, the weather is something you've been covering and we've been covering for the last several days there on the West Coast. All right, Dana Griffin, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's get to some international headlines now. Polls are now closed in Pakistan after a controversial and violent election day that also shut down mobile internet service across the country. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us with that and other world news. Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. That internet shutdown came a day after two bombs ripped through southwestern Pakistan, killing at least 30 people at campaign offices. Pakistan's interior ministry saying today that with the terror threat so high, they had to take security measures to maintain law and order on election day. But voting rights groups are calling it censorship, especially given that Pakistan's military is accused of trying to meddle in this election. Now, let's go to Haiti, where protests against Prime Minister Ariel Henry have turned deadly. A law enforcement union says a, shout, a shootout erupted in Haiti's capital with police killing five armed environmental protection agents who also work for the government. Now, this is not the first clash between police and environmental officers, some of whom have joined protesters who are demanding that the prime minister step down. And finally, to France, where one man's hopes of setting a new Guinness World Record for the tallest Eiffel Tower replica made of matchsticks has just gone up in flames. It took Richard Plodd eight years, more than 700,000 matchsticks and 50 pounds of glue to build the 23 and a half foot tall model. But the Guinness Book of World Records disqualified his entry because he didn't use commercially available matchsticks. The good news for him is Guinness says it is now reviewing that decision. All right. Joe? Read the fine print, I guess, if you're going to endeavor such a project. All right, Josh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, we've got a major new study on transgender Americans. After the break, how a majority of those surveyed say they feel after transitioning. But first, Prince William making his first public comments about his father, King Charles' cancer diagnosis. Those stories and much more coming up next. Welcome back. Prince William is speaking publicly for the first time since his father, King Charles' cancer diagnosis, and his wife, Princess Kate's recent medical procedure. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest from London. It is a rainy day here at Buckingham Palace, but Kensington Palace tells NBC News that Prince William is really doing that balancing act between supporting his wife, Kate, the Princess of Wales, of course, as she continues to recover, and their three kids, but also these stepped-up royal duties. We saw him last night decked out for a big event right here in London, and by his side, Tom Cruise. Take a look. For the first time since his father's cancer diagnosis, Prince William is back to work and addressing his family's health scares. We really appreciate everyone's kind message. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you also 
for the kind messages of support for Catherine and for my father, especially in recent days. Kensington Palace saying that Kate, the Princess of Wales, is still recuperating at home while William balances his return to public duties, attending a gala for London's Air Ambulance charity, even cracking a joke. The past few weeks have had a rather medical focus, so I thought I'd come to an air ambulance function to get away from it all. <laughs> <laughs> the event bringing in the stars, including Tom Cruise, a longtime supporter and sometimes pilot. And Tom, if you wouldn't mind not borrowing either of the new helicopters for the next Mission Impossible, it would be appreciated. Williams started out the day performing investitures at Windsor Castle. As brother Harry was spotted back at Heathrow Airport 24 hours after racing to his father's side. The relationship between Charles and Harry is on the mend. Although the meeting was short, it was on medical grounds that that meeting was short. And King Charles still out in the countryside today, speaking with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on the phone yesterday. And plans to continue his state duties, including his weekly audience with Sunak, at least for now. Now, we're pretty used to seeing the Prince of Wales and the Princess of Wales, of course, when she's feeling better at these star-studded, glamorous events. We will start to see the Prince of Wales, though, pick up more of these day-to-day -day mundane events that his father does later today. Queen Camilla, who's also, of course, doing that balancing act between supporting her husband and a full program of royal duties. We will see her tonight at an event just outside of London. I'll send it back to you. All right, Molly, thank you so much. A new survey is taking a closer look at the quality of life of transgender people living in the U.S. The National Center for Transgender Equality, one of the country's largest trans rights organizations, just released its 2022 U.S. Transgender Survey. It's the largest survey of trans people in U.S. history. More than 90,000 people found that trans people are still experiencing workplace and medical discrimination. Despite all this, the majority of those who are polled still report an improvement in life satisfaction after after transitioning. NBC out reporter Joe Yurkaba joins us now with a closer look at the survey. Joe, good to have you with us. So first of all, let's just look at the big picture. What are the main takeaways here? Good morning, Joe. So yeah, one of the key data points found that out of these about 90,000 trans adults, the overwhelming majority of them, about 94% total, were at least a little or a lot more satisfied with life after transition. And those rates were similarly high if they received hormone treatment or uh, gender affirming surgery, at least 98% of trans adults said they were a little or a lot more satisfied after hormone treatment, and 97% said they were a little or a lot more satisfied after surgery. So those, those are really, really high rates. So this comes with the human rights campaign saying already more than 130 bills targeting transgender rights have been introduced and filed in states around the country. Talk about the impact these bills, not just this year, but in the last few years, how they're impacting the community. Right. Well, what we've been hearing for the last few years is that it's getting people to consider moving out of their states, and a lot of them have already left, and that's what this data shows. It found that 45 percent of trans respondents, nearly half, have considered moving due to bills targeting trans people, and 5 percent, or about 4,600 people, have actually moved to another state. The survey also touches on, on something that's really important here, what the trans community is experiencing at home with their families, because ultimately that probably has the biggest impact on just how they are feeling. What was the overall response, especially when it comes to trans youth? Are they feeling accepted and supported by their families? Well, the survey found that what's happening in state houses might not actually reflect what's happening uh, to trans people at home because the majority of trans adults reported that uh, their families were supportive at 67 percent and 22 percent said they were neither supportive nor unsupportive and just 12 said their families were unsupportive. Uh, 16 and 17 year olds trans youth were a little lower. 44 percent said their families were supportive and it's unclear exactly why that rate is lower. It could be because of the rhetoric we're hearing in legislature across the country, or it could just be that their families have had less time to kind of sit with the fact that they've come out. So the information from this survey about how people are feeling, whether they're feeling supported, it can actually be useful in the discussions we're seeing play out in state houses when it comes to transgender rights and advocacy. Talk about how that information can be useful in these discussions. 
Right. So the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality said during a press conference that he hopes this data with the large sample size will be helpful to combat some of the misinformation we're hearing coming out of state legislatures. And that's specifically this persistent idea that trans people are really likely to regret their transition. And this data shows pretty overwhelmingly that that just isn't true. All right. Joe, you're okay, but good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. After her Northern California hometown was devastated by wildfires, a 75-year-old grandmother decided she wanted to serve the community that meant everything to her. So she joined the ranks of her local volunteer fire department. NBC's Kathy Park has that story. Out of the ashes of the 2018 campfire, one of the deadliest and most destructive natural disasters in California's history, emerged the newest volunteer firefighter. 75 year old Mary Jarski. Sometimes people will say something like, Oh, I'm old. And I'm like, Well, yeah, that's going to happen to all of us. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we have to quit doing the things that we enjoy doing or, you know, quit being challenged. According to the Butte County Fire Department, anyone over the age of 18 who wants to help their community can join its volunteer firefighter squad. And Jarski fit the bill. But she knew the training wasn't going to be easy. I keep thinking, man, if I'd started when I was 30, I'd be so, just excuse the expression, badass. I mean, I'm still pretty badass at 75, but really, I, I wish I'd done it sooner. Every day I'd show up and say, I'm just going to try. And at the end of the day, um, yeah, no, I feel pretty proud of myself, actually. She was one of 19 cadets in the program, some of them nearly six decades her junior, all of them training for more than 200 hours. How demanding is the training program? It's fairly physical. They have to um, drag charge hose lines, wear heavy packs. We have our self-contained breathing apparatus that they have to wear. We do a lot of fire training. But Jarski is no stranger to pressure, spending 30 years on the front lines caring for others as a registered nurse. And she's hoping all that experience can be put to use in her new role. It takes time, I think, to develop and to be able to look at someone and assess them and um, kind of know what to do. And I, that's where I feel pretty confident. <sighs> Jarski plans to volunteer at the fire station in her hometown of Concow after graduating from the program this weekend. And this grandmother is set to make history as the oldest cadet ever to complete the academy. I want people to see me out there and think to themselves, hey, maybe I could do that too because it's a, a great opportunity to, you know, we to serve your community and just, we need it. I mean, it doesn't important. bother me that I'm 75. I'm happy to be here. Proof that it's never too late to start something new. Kathy Park, NBC News. All right, coming up, hanging up after the break, the shaky future of the humble and nostalgic landline and the old school purists who aren't quite ready to drop that call just yet. I've got that story next on Morning News Now. Back now with some financial headlines, and OpenAI is now hiring for a child safety team. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Yeah, OpenAI has formed a new team to study ways to prevent its tools like ChatGPT from being misused or abused by kids. In a new job listing on its current career page, uh, OpenAI has revealed the existence of a child safety team. It's working with platform policy, legal, and investigation groups to try to manage processes, incidents, and reviews related to underage users. Kids and teens are increasingly turning to AI tools for help, not just with schoolwork, but actually with personal problems. A recent poll found 29% of kids report having used chat GPT to deal with anxiety or mental health issues. Apple, meantime, has made an AI image tool that lets you make edits by describing them in text prompts without the need for knowledge of how to use photo editing software. The tool can crop, resize, flip, and add filters to images. And users just have to type out what they want in order to change the picture. Apple, which has not been a big player in generative AI technology so far, has made this new tool available to download on GitHub. 
And Beyonce has officially announced her long-awaited hair care line, Sacred. It's, it's spelled C-E-C-R-E-D, but pronounced Sacred. The superstar posting a clip to Instagram this week in collaboration with the brand's new account. The video appears to feature a young Beyonce inside her mom's hair salon in Houston. The brand launches on February 20th, and reports say the business will sell items such uh, as cosmetic preparations for hair care, hair growth stimulants, styling tools, cosmetic bags, cases, and sleep masks. It's amazing how these performers are creating these brands. Rihanna's Fenty, according to Forbes, is valued now at about two point eight billion dollars and her cosmetics lines has more than half a billion dollars in annual sales that so these are incredible, incredible business women along with being amazing artists no kidding bertha quick question for you do you still have an old school landline bertha i do i do although you know it's not a landline anymore it's not the old twisted pairs we used to call it it's now voip but i remember when there was a blackout uh, like 20 years ago here in new york I had a landline and I was one of the few people who could actually make calls because if your phone wasn't charged or your phone lost a charge or even your your wireless phone yep. doesn't necessarily work. Exactly. So. All right. Well, then this next story might be for you, Bertha. We have some bad news for lovers of, of the old school landline phone service before the VOIP. About a quarter of adults in the U.S. still have that traditional landline. That number, though, is likely going to drop as phone companies look to phase out the old school service. But some land Online users just aren't ready to say goodbye to the old tech just yet. Like the curly Q cord immortalized in Sleepless in Seattle, the landline connects us to the past. Oh my god, she's so annoying. Who is? Who's this? Gretchen? The drama of Mean Girls. You like scary movies? Uh huh. Horror of Scream. I'm looking for a Mrs. O problem. First name B. Come on, guys. Do I have a B.O. problem here? And the humor of a prank call by Bart Simpson. Even today, it's hard to hang up. And this is for when the power goes out. With the landline becoming a punchline on social media. Guess what I'm calling you from? <laughs> A rotisserie phone. We actually still have a landline phone here in this house. Jay Zagorski is an associate professor at Boston University's Questrom School of Business and is part of the 26% of American adults who still have a landline. He just can't always rely on his cell. I do a fair number of interviews and the internet isn't always working. You don't always get good sound quality. But he knows landlines are fading away. As recently as last week, phone service providers have made moves to stop servicing traditional landlines. It comes as they replace the copper wires used for those landlines with faster technologies like fiber optic and wireless. But that worries those who feel the old school landline is a lifeline. More reliable if the power goes out during a storm or hurricane. Can you hear me now? More trusted than spotty cell phone service in rural areas. So there's going to be some problems, especially in rural areas, if landline phones completely disappear. Experts say landlines will eventually totally transition to wireless and fiber technology, something Van Agens already uses. What is that? That is a rotary phone. It was pretty inexpensive to get, and it's, it's more of like a novelty. We spoke with Robert Frieden, a telecommunications professor at Penn State. He says in the big cities, the top 100 urban markets, we could see traditional landline service end in the next two to three years with other smaller places. Take Superstar Taylor Swift is in Japan this week for the international leg of her Eras Tour. There are a lot of questions about whether she'll make it to Las Vegas in time this weekend to watch her boyfriend Travis Kelsey compete in the Super Bowl. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has the latest. On Taylor Mania. Well, few topics can get people talking quite like Taylor Swift. The singer is kicking off her Asia tour with four sold out shows in Tokyo, but all the buzz is about what comes after. Can music's biggest star make it to football's biggest game in time? Now, Swift is not publicly confirmed she will even attend the Super Bowl to cheer on her boyfriend, Travis Kelsey, as the Kansas City Chiefs take on the San Francisco 49ers for the championship. The burning question, is it even possible to make it from Tokyo to Las Vegas before kickoff if the last concert is on Saturday night? 
Now, the Internet has been on fire with flight trackers and time zone calculators. Even Japan's embassy in Washington has been trying to assure Swifties that will, it will all be okay. Uh, they issued a tongue-in-cheek statement saying they should, quote, shake it off and be, quote, fearless. Meanwhile, fans in Tokyo are caught up in Taylor mania. There are long lines for merchandise, fans wearing glitter, tassels, sharing homemade bracelets, all the hallmarks of the Eras tour that blazed across the U.S. last year. Every show in Asia for the next month is sold out. There are no dates planned for here in China. Taylor Swift, of course, fresh off making music history with her fourth album of the year win at the Grammys. As for the Super Bowl, Time is on Taylor and Travis's side. Japan is one of the first countries west of the international date line, so there is a full 17 hours uh, ahead of Vegas. So it's more than feasible for Taylor Swift to land there before dawn on game day, though private jet parking these days is apparently tricky. <laughs> for this hour of Morning News Now, news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.